The Iliad, Chapter 7 Hector rushed through the gates, and his brother Paris came with him, their hearts eager for battle. Zeus sometimes gives a tailwind to sailors, at just the moment their arms and legs can push no more their polished fir firwood oars. So these two appeared to the Trojans. Each took out his man, Paris killing Menestheus, son of ox-eyed Philomedousa, and Areithios, whose iron mace ruled Arne. Hector's spear blade sliced Ilenus's neck. Beneath his bronze helmet, his limbs went limp. Elsewhere, in the crush of battle, Glaucus, son of Hippolochus and Lycian commander, hit Iphonus in the shoulder with his spear as he clambered up behind his racing mares. He fell from his chariot, and his limbs went slack. Athena's gray eyes had all this in focus, and when she saw the Greeks being beaten, she swooped down from the peaks of Olympus to sacred Ilion. Apollo, who wanted victory for the Trojans, saw her coming as he watched from his lookout, on Pergamum, and he rose up to meet her. They met by the ancient oak tree. Lord Apollo, Zeus's son, spoke first. Daughter of great Zeus, why have you come again from Olympus? What mission are you on now? Is it to turn the tide of battle for the Greeks? Since you have no idea for the Trojans' losses, I have a better idea. Let's halt the bloodshed, for today they can fight later, with Ilion on the line. Since you, deathless ones, have your hearts set on destroying this city. And the gray-eyed goddess Athena replied, So be it, Apollo. This is just what I had in mind in coming from Olympus to the Trojans and Greeks. But how do you intend to stop them from fighting? Lord Apollo, son of Zeus, replied, We could rouse the hard spirit of Hector and have him challenge one of the Greeks. To fight against him, man to man, the Greeks would be indignant and rouse someone to battle Hector in single combat. Grey-eyed Athena agreed to his plan. And Helenus, Troy's seer and Priam's son, understood in his heart what these gods had agreed to. He went up to Hector and spoke to him in convincing tones. Hector, Son of Priam, Zeus is equal in wisdom. Will you listen to me? I am your brother. Have all the Greeks and Trojans sit down. Challenge the best of the Greeks to fight you, man to man, in single combat. It is not your fate to meet your end now. Thus I have heard from the gods eternal. Thus Helenus and Hector was persuaded. He went out in front along the Trojan ranks, holding a spear broadside, and they all sat down. Agamemnon had his Greeks sit down, and Athena and a silver-bowed Apollo sat like vultures in Zeus's tall oak, enjoying the warriors who sat rank on rank, bristling with shields, helmets, and spears. As a fresh blast of the west wind ripples the sea, and the sea blackens beneath it. So sat the ranks of Trojans and Greeks across the plain, and Hector spoke to them. Hear me out, Trojans and Achaean warriors, until I have spoken what my heart commands. Zeus on high has made our oaths nothing. Hostile to both sides, he means for us to fight until you either take the towers of Troy or are beaten down beside your seafaring ships. There are among you the best of all Greece. If any of you have the will to fight me, none other than Hector, come forward now. I declare these terms with Zeus as my witness. If your champion cuts me down with bronze, he can strip my armor and take it back to your ships. My body, though, he will return to my home to be burned in honor by Trojans and their wives. If I kill him, if Apollo gives me that glory, I will take his armor to Holy Ilion and hang it in the temple of the Archer God. The corpse I will send back to your hollow ships, so you long-haired Achaeans can give it burial, 
and heap up a tomb by the broad Hellespont. So someone in generations yet to come will say as he sails by on the darkening sea, that is the tomb of a man long dead, killed in his prime by glorious Hector. Someone will say that, and my fame will not die. So he spoke, and they were all hushed and silent, ashamed to refuse and afraid to accept. Finally, Menelaus stood up. He was groaning inwardly, but spoke to them in contemptuous tones. It seems we're good at threatening the Trojans, but when it comes down to it, we're women, not men. This day will go down in infamy if no Danan meets Hector's challenge now. May you all turn to mud, sitting here without any guts and no call to glory. I'll put on armor myself. Win or lose, it's all in the hands of the immortal gods. And with that, he put on his armor. And yes, Menelaus, your life would have flickered out then in Hector's palms, because he was far stronger had not the Achaean commanders rim up and grabbed you, Agamemnon too, the great warlord, holding you back with his right hand, saying, Have you lost your royal mind, Menelaus? There's no call for you to behave like this. Get hold of yourself. You don't volunteer in the spirit of rivalry to fight someone you're no match for. This is Priam's son, Hector, we're talking about. Everyone fears him. Even Achilles tightens up at the thought of facing him in battle, and he's far better than you. Just sit down here with your troops now. The Achaeans will come up with another champion, and even if he's a fearless glutton for combat, he'll be glad to bend his knees and rest if he ever gets out of this one alive. Agamemnon said all the right things, and changed his brother's mind. Relieved, Menelaus's aides took off his armor. Then Nestor stood up and spoke. It's a sad day for Greece, a sad day. Old Peleus the charioteer would groan, the Myrmidons' his great counselor and king, who questioned me once in his house, and reveled in all our heroic lineages. If he were to hear all these men cowering before Hector, he would lift his hands to the immortal gods and pray for his soul, to leave his body and sink into Hades. O oh, Father Zeus, and Athena, and Apollo, if only I were young again, as in the days the Pelians and spear-mad Arcadians gathered near the rushing Celadon and fought under Phaea's walls by the streams of Iardanus, on their side, Eurathelion, a man like a god, stood forth as champion, wearing the armor of King Erytheus, the Mace Man, as men and satin-waisted women called him, because he fought with neither bow nor spear, but broke battalions with his iron mace. Well, Lycurgus killed him by guile, not strength, in a narrow pass where his mace of iron did him no good. Before he could react, Lycurgus skewered him with his spear. Down he went, and Lycurgus stripped from him the armor he had gotten from bronze Ares, and he wore that armor whenever he went to war. And when Lycurgus was an old man in his halls, he gave it to Eurathlion, who had been his squire. Wearing that armor, he challenged all our best. They all trembled with fear. No one dared but me. My heart pumped me up for battle, although I was the youngest of them all. And so we fought, and Athena gave me glory. That was the tallest and strongest man I've ever killed. An enormous hulk sprawled out on the ground. If I were as young now and my strength still firm, helmeted Hector would have a fight on his hands. But now here you are, the best of the Achaeans, and not one is ready to face off with this Trojan. The old man scolded them, and Nine stood up. First up was the warlord Agamemnon, followed by Tydeus' son Diomedes, and the two Ajaxes, clothed in fury. Next were Idomeneus and his companion Meroenes, who weighed in like Ares, 
and Eurypleus, Eumaeon's fine son, and up rose Thoas and brilliant Odysseus, all of them willing to do battle with Hector. Then the horseman Nestor spoke out again, Now cast lots to see who will be chosen, whoever it is will enrich the Achaeans and enrich his own heart if he gets out alive from the grim business of bloody combat. He spoke, and each man marked his lot, and cast it into Agamemnon's helmet. Hands lifted to the gods, the troops said their prayers. Someone would say with a glance at the sky, Let it be Ajax, Father Zeus, or Diomedes, or the king of golden Mycenae himself. Nestor shook the helmet, and out jumped the lot of the man they all wanted. It was Ajax's. A herald took it down the line from left to right, and showed it to each of the Achaean elite. They all disclaimed it until he came to Ajax, who held out his hand. The herald gave him the lot. When Ajax saw it was his, he smiled inwardly, and threw it on the ground by his foot, and said, My friends, the lot is mine, and I'm glad of it, because I think I'm going to beat Hector. But listen, while I am putting on my battle gear, pray to Lord Zeus, the son of Cronus, silently to yourselves, so the Trojans won't hear. Or pray openly, since there is no one we fear. No one can drive me off against my will, by force or skill. I was born and bred in Salamis, and I know I am no fool. Thus, Ajax, you could hear the Greeks saying their prayers to Lord Zeus, eyes lifted up to broad, flat sky. Father Zeus, on Ida above, grant the splendor of victory to Ajax. But if you love Hector and care for him too, vouchsafe to both equal power and glory. While they prayed, Ajax was clapping on gleaming bronze armor, and when every inch of his skin was covered, he hustled forward like the giant god of war himself when he enters a soul-devouring battle that men have joined but Zeus has ordained. Ajax was that big, a human barricade, a Greek wall, the gristle that was his face arranged in a smile, and with every huge stride the long shadow of his spear sagged and quivered. The Greeks liked what they saw, but the Trojans trembled, and Hector felt his heart pounding in his chest. It was impossible for him, though, to melt back into the ranks. He had issued the challenge. Ajax kept coming, holding a shield that was like a city tower, seven folds of ox hide. Mastered with bronze, the work of Tychius, whose shop was in Hyle, the best leather worker on earth, who had made this shimmering shield from seven tough hides and an eighth layer of bronze. Telamonian Ajax held it in front of his chest now, and put his face in Hector's as he said, Take a good look, Hector! This is what the heroes are like in the Greek army, even when Achilles isn't here smashing skulls. He's back there with the ships now, nursing his grudge against Agamemnon. But we still have a few good men to fight you, more than a few. It's your move. Hector's helmet gathered the fading light. Telamonian Ajax, Zeus born, the captain, don't try to unnerve me as if I were some kid or a woman who wouldn't know one end of a spear from another. I've been in a few battles and killed a few men, and I know a few moves. I can go with this shield to the right or the left, dodge through charging horses, or fight hand to hand with fancy footwork. But I'm not going to try anything fancy on you. I'm going to hit you straight on, if my aim is good. The taunts were over. Carefully, Hector balanced his spear, and when he threw it, its long shadow swept over the earth, and it bored through the bronze skin of Ajax's shield, and through six oxhide layers. But the seventh layer of leather stopped it. 
It was Ajax's turn now. His long-shadowed spear crashed through the round of Hector's shield and ripped into the intricate breastplate, the point shearing his shirt and nicking his ribs as Hector twisted aside from black fatality. They wrenched their spears back out and went at each other again. Like lions, after raw meat, or wild boars in rut. Hector stabbed his spear dead into Ajax's shield, but the bronze point crumpled on its surface, and Ajax was upon him, thrusting his spear hard through Hector's shield. The force of the blow stunned him, and the point grazed his neck. Growing and drawing dark blood, this didn't stop Hector. He gave ground and picked up a stone, gripping it in one hand, a huge black slab lying in the plain, and heaved it into Ajax's massive shield, hitting it on the boss. The bronze rang like a gong. Ajax in turn picked up a much bigger rock, the size of a millstone, and, whirling around, put his enormous strength into the throw, crushing Hector's shield and buckling his knees. He lay curled on his back, under his shield, but Apollo quickly put him on his feet again, and they would have gone at each other with swords had not the heralds, Zeus's messengers and men's, come forward from both sides. Talthibius and Idaeus, prudent men both, they held their staffs between the two combatants, and Idaeus made this formal pronouncement. Fight no more, dear sons, nor battle more. Zeus beyond the clouds loves you both, and you are both spearmen, as we all know. Now it is night, and it is good to yield to night. Telamonian Ajax said in response, Have Hector speak these words, Idaeus. He was the one who challenged our best to fight. It's his call. I'll go along with what he says. And great Hector, helmeted in gold, replied, Ajax, since a god has given you size and strength and wisdom too, and you are the best of the Achaeans with a spear, let us call a truce to our hostilities for today. Another time we will fight again, until Zeus grants one of us the victory. Now it is night, and it is good to yield tonight. You to make glad the Greeks beside your ships, and especially the kinfolk and friends you have. Myself to make glad throughout Priam City, the Trojans and their wives in long trailing robes, who will for my sake throng Ilion's shrines. But now we should exchange glorious gifts, so that the Greeks and Trojans will say of us, they fought each other in soul-devouring strife, but agreed to part in the spirit of friendship. And he gave him his silver-studded sword, along with its scabbard and tooled belt. Ajax gave him his own belt, bright with scarlet. Then they parted. Ajax went to the Greeks, Hector to the Trojans, who were glad to see him coming back to join them, having escaped with his life from the hands of grim Ajax. They led him back to the city, scarcely believing he was really safe. On their side, the Greeks led Ajax to Agamemnon, glad he had won. When they were in Agamemnon's quarters, the warlord sacrificed an ox for them, a bull of five years, to mighty Cronion. They flayed and dressed it, jointed the limbs, and sliced them skillfully, skewered the pieces, roasted them carefully, and drew them off the spits. When they were done and the feast was ready, feast they did, and no one lacked an equal share. The long chine was given in honor to Ajax by the commander-in-chief, Lord Agamemnon, when they had had enough of food and drink. The first to spin out his plan was Nestor, whose advice had always seemed best before. He was full of good will in the speech he made. Son of Atreus and Greek leaders all, 
Many of our flowing-haired boys are dead, their blood spilled by Ares near the Scamander, their souls bound for Hades. And so there is need for the army to pause from combat, and at dawn collect the corpses and wheel them back here by ox and mule cart. We will burn them near the ships, so that when we return to our land, we may bear their bones home to their children. Near the pyre we will heap a common barrow, out into the plain, and up against it we will build a high wall, working fast, a defense for our ships and for ourselves, and set in it close-fitting gates, so there will be a way to drive chariots through. Just outside the wall we will dig a deep trench as a hazard for enemy troops and horses, should the proud Trojans ever press us hard. Thus Nestor and all the kings assented. Meanwhile, on the Acropolis of Troy, an unruly assembly mobbed Priam's doors. Wise Antenor led off with this speech. Hear me, Trojans and Dardanian allies, that I might speak my heart. All right, then, let us give Helen of Argos to Atreus' sons, her and her possessions, for them to take away. We are fighting in false hope and false faith, and can have no profit from it. This is our only hope. He had his say and sat down. Then up st stood rich-haired Helen's husband, godlike Paris, who answered him with these winged words. I don't like what you are saying, Antenor. You know how to speak better than this. But if you really mean what you are saying, then the gods must have destroyed your wits. This is what I have to say to the Trojans, and I'll say it straight out. I won't give her back. But the treasure I brought with her from Argos, I will give back, and add some of my own. He had his say, and sat down. Then uprose Dardanian Priam, peer of the gods in council, full of good will in the speech that he made. Hear me, Trojans and Dardanian allies, that I might speak my heart. For the present, Take your dinner throughout the city as usual, and each man of you be alert and on watch. At dawn, Idaeus will go to the Greek ships to tell Atreus' sons, Menelaus and Agamemnon, the word of Alexander, who is the cause of this war, and to propose an armistice to burn the dead. Later, we will fight again, until the deity decides between us and bestows the victory. He spoke, they listened, and they did as he said. The army took their supper by platoons. At dawn, Idaeus went down to the ships, and found the Greek warlords assembled beside the stern of Agamemnon's vessel. The wind from the Aegean carried his voice. Son of Atreus, and Achaean princes all, Priam and the other lords of Troy bid me tell you, and may it be sweet to your ears, the word of Alexander, the cause of our strife, all of the treasure he brought back to Troy, in his ship's hold, would he had died beforehand, he will give back, and add some of his own, but the former wife of renowned Menelaus, he will not give back. Though the Trojans bid him, as they bid me also, propose, if you are willing, an armistice until we can burn the dead. Later we will fight again, until the deity decides between us and bestows the victory. He spoke. And they were all hushed in silence, until Diomedes' martial voice boomed out. Accept nothing from Alexander, not even Helen. Even a fool can see the noose is tightening around the Trojans. The Greeks cheered when they heard this, delighted with Diomedes' blunt reply. And Lord Agamemnon addressed Idaeus. Idaeus, 
you yourself hear the Greeks answer, and it is my pleasure too. As for burning the corpses, I do not begrudge it at all. One does not stint the dead, or deny to them the swift consolation of fire. May Zeus, Hera's thundering consort, witness our oaths. And he lifted up his staff to the gods. Idaeus went back to sacred Ilion, where Trojans and Dardanians sat in assembly, awaiting his return. He stood in their midst and delivered his message, and they set to work, to bring in the dead and gather wood. Likewise the Greeks, hurrying from their ships, brought in their dead and gathered wood. The sun's light lay new on the fields, as it rose from deep, soft waters of ocean and climbed the sky. The armies met on the plain. It was difficult to recognize each of the dead, but they washed the clotted blood with water, and, shedding hot tears, lifted them onto carts. Great Priam would not allow his people to wail aloud, so in silence they heaped the corpses on the pyre, grieving at heart, and when they had burned them, they returned to sacred Ilion, and the Greeks, too, heaped the corpses on their pyre, grief in their hearts, and having burned them, returned to the ships. It was twilight before the following dawn, when chosen tr Greek troops gathered at the pyre, working fast. They heaped around it, a common barrow extending out on the plain, and up against it they built a high wall, to protect their camp, complete with tight gates, so there would be a way to drive chariots through. Just outside the wall, they dug a trench, deep and wide, and in it planted stakes. As the Greeks toiled, their hair flowing around their shoulders and bronze chests, the gods, seated around lightning Zeus, marveled at their work. Poseidon, lord of the islands, was first to speak. Father Zeus, is there now any mortal in all the wide world who will tell the gods what he intends? Do you see that the Greeks have built a wall and trench around their ships, without offering us bulls by the hundred? Fame of this will reach as far as dawn spreads light, and men will forget the wall that Apollo and I built with toil for the hero Laomedon. This provoked a troubled, gloomy response. What a thing for you to say, you the Templar! Some lesser god might fear this ploy, but not you, whose fame will reach as far as dawn spreads light. Choose your time, when the Greeks have left with their ships for home. Smash the wall to bits and sweep it out to sea, and cover the great beach again with sand, so that the Achaeans' wall becomes a dwindling thought. As they spoke to each other in this way, the sun went down, and the Greeks' work was done. They slaughtered oxen and took their supper outside their huts. Wine ships from Lemnos had just sailed in, sent by Jason's son, Euneus. The son, Hypsipyle, bore to the great adventurer, Euneus, had shipped for the sons of Atreus, Agamemnon and Menelaus, a special consignment, a thousand liters of sweet red. The other Greeks went on board to barter for their wine, some with bronze, others with iron, hides, cattle, or slaves. They made a rich feast. All night long the Greeks feasted, and the Trojans feasted with their allies throughout the city, and all night long Zeus the counselor devised evil for them, thundering terribly. Pale fear seized them, and no man dared drink before spilling wine to Cronus's mighty son. Sleep was welcome when it finally came. <laughs>